We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are finally, for the first time in five years, and for the first time since we've been Formula One fans, we are racing in China. No, I'm just going to put a pause there, Catherine. We still have not had a free practice and we are not on the grid. I still I know you're waiting. You're you're waiting for for lights out. I am waiting for lights out, honestly, (laughs) because it's been on the calendar for the past five years and we just haven't been there. So, yeah. Yeah. And and that is for those of you who don't know, that is uh, due to um, China's COVID policies over the last couple of years. Um, China was on the calendar last year, but they still had a lot of stringent COVID restrictions in place. So it was removed from the calendar. And now it looks like it's probably going to happen. Drivers are in China. You know, I think that people are are in the paddock setting up at this point. It's it's Wednesday, late Wednesday. It's probably early Thursday morning in China as we're recording this. Um, so I think it might actually happen. My China 2024 is your Vegas 2023. Your Vegas 23 <laughs> as well. You're right. You're right. It is my Vegas 2023. No, it's, I mean, all signs are pointing to we will be racing. I'm very excited. Um, it it should be a very entertaining race, hopefully, just because not many people have raced there and it's been five years since we've raced there. Right. Um, you know, we can age Fernando Alonso and say how many times he's raced there versus everyone else. But um, I'm excited to be back. And it's kind of pseudo semi a new track for those who are just getting into Formula One. Yeah, I mean, for for most of the grid, it's it's gonna be a, a pretty brand new track, brand brand new race. There, there's a lot that we don't know, which factored into making my predictions really, really hard. And we'll talk oh about gosh, those later. But, but yeah, it's it's gonna be really interesting. But I'm really I'm excited to you know go somewhere quote unquote new. Yeah, and I'm excited to ha- have a race again. I mean, I know we have a you know good schedule going but it's been two weeks it's felt to me like a month just because Emily can't do time um but not a huge you know media news time off over the last two weeks not a ton has come out um but there's enough for me to get excited about contracts Yep, we have a contracts update. We do. So at the top of our episode, per usual with our contracts, Fernando Alonso has signed an extension with Aston Martin that will take him through to the new regulations in 2026. I love this. Love this for him. I love how he, you know, talked down and kind of shaded Mercedes. Mercedes. Saying like, they're not where we're at. Why would I look at a worse team? Um, props to him for for saying that in an interview Um, but I'm I'm very excited to see you know old man winter stay on the grid longer we have you know two more seasons with him after this season I'm happy about it I'm sure daddy strolls happy about it Um, this is exciting yeah it's it's really interesting to me because they're they're not they they haven't really talked about the duration of the contract, which is really interesting because usually it's like, here's a one-year extension, here's a two-year extension, right. here's a, you know, 800-year extension to 2029, if we're talking about like someone like Charles Leclerc. Um, but this one has been characterized as kind of a lifetime contract. And I, I, I don't, I, I say lifetime with a big grain of salt, um, but it looks like this is setting Fernando up to kind of become the Nikki Lauda of of Aston Martin. Yeah. Which I love too. I think he's so wise in his many years on the grid. Um, but he also is very involved and it seems like he's really taken to this, you know, coaching kind of thing with Lance. He's enjoying the team, enjoying the atmosphere. He seems to be much happier than he was at Alpine. Um, Big time. I like this relationship. I do. And like I said, yeah. I'm, I'm a huge Fernando Alonso fan. Um, I love having him on the grid. I think it just adds some levity. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. And I, I think it's interesting because like this is also the agreement that Lewis wanted with Mercedes that Mercedes wouldn't give him. I know. I was sent him the to same Ferrari. thing of like, you know, he got it and Lewis didn't. And I, I mean, 
who knows what made them pull the trigger. Again, for those of you who are newer to Formula One, all contract negotiations generally happen towards the end of the first half of the season and then things actually happen in silly season which is during the summer break this year is completely different for um fernando alonso you know signing an extension now is not common lewis hamilton moving to ferrari before the season even starts is super not common so i feel like we're just going to have this mayhem constantly this season because we have so many seats open that if people wait and wait and wait either teams are going to get screwed or drivers are going to get screwed so I I think seeing another big contract come out with a you know prominent driver is just really showing us that that's the trend that this is that's what's going to happen this year yeah and especially when you think about you know Aston Martin is definitely like a that's a seat that people want so that seat is off the board Lance's is also probably off the board because let's be real, as long as Lance wants to continue driving in Formula One, Daddy Stroll is going to let him. Um, So that's that's a high profile seat off the board. That's a high profile seat that somebody who doesn't have a drive next year, Carlos Sainz, can't take. So it it really it narrows down the available seats we've got you know, Mercedes, we've got maybe a Red Bull, though it looks like that Sergio Perez is going to stick around at at Red Bull for another few years. Uh, We've got something going on with Sauber, maybe. Um, So it it really brings to question where A, Carlos is going to go, but B, where everybody else who is out of contract at the end of this year is going to go. And to to what you said about, you know, them and, you know, them announcing so early with all of these, these, you know, driver changes, contract announcements. um, I think that they're going to announce them as they come just so that everybody knows, you know, what's going on and what's available because there's all this, these machinations going on behind the scenes. So it's, we're going to be getting contracts updates all year long. Yeah. I love it. But it also gives me anxiety, and I also hate, like, all of the dumb stories where it's like, well, this person was seen crossing paths with this person, so you know what that means. It's like, they were walking. Leave oh, alone. yeah. Like, Adrian Newey was in Italy somewhere <laughs> driving some cars, and it was like, oh, my God, he's, he's going to Ferrari. Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> it's... It's hilarious, it is. Um, but but yeah, it's it's a lot, and obviously, you know, Adrian Newey is not even a, one of the ten, you know, the twenty drivers. He is a high profile member of the the Red Bull staff, so it's it's really there's going to be a lot of this all season long, and it's probably going to get a little annoying. But at the same time, it'll be interesting to see how the grid starts to shape up for next year as this season 2024 continues on because this is all for 2025 which is not yet speaking of 2025 the calendar is released that's exciting yes it was it was released early um i like this calendar we've there's some questions that we have but what i i really like is that australia is back where it belongs as the opener yes yes the the yeah. chaos that is Australia is the opener. I'm excited. Cannot wait. Um, yeah. I really like it. They moved some things around. Um, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia are moved to April now because of Ramadan, which I think makes sense. Those were on Saturdays um, this season instead of Sundays. The one thing I don't understand is Canada. Right. Like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It makes no sense that it's right smack in the middle of, like, the European tour. Um, yeah. Maybe they have other things going on in Canada to where they can't make it work with, you know, the rest of the U.S. races. I know that we have Miami randomly, but that's because of football season, so I do understand yeah. that because um, the Miami Miami track, can't be in the fall. Right. The Miami track is um, with the Hard Rock Stadium, which is where the Dolphins play um, American football. Um, so we only have one Saturday race next year, which is Vegas, which I, I don't mind that being a Saturday night race. Yeah, well, well, what's, well it's also in, in important, especially if you're an American Formula One fan listening to this podcast, which I know is, is a great number of you. That doesn't mean that all that all of the other 23 races are not on Saturdays. It's just 
like locally it's on Saturday we will have you know Japan will be a Saturday night race Australia will be a Saturday night race things like that but yeah there there's one Saturday night race I I also like that they went back to that yeah um because I just Formula One should be on Sunday yeah no but I like it and it and it Vegas has to be at night and it has to be on a Saturday because that makes it Sunday in Europe right and can you just imagine racing down the strip in like broad daylight? Like that's stupid. <laughs> well, that's what they did back in in the in the eighties. I mean, it wasn't down the strip; it was in the Caesar's Palace parking lot. Um, that that was the the OG Vegas track was a parking lot track technically. Um, but yeah, I, I I like this. Canada will will always be weird, but you're probably right that there's something going on that you can't put it in the fall with the rest of the North American South American legs. Um, and it also yeah, might we'll, be for weather, honestly. Because Canada's so far north, if you put it in October, like, you could have snow. That could be interesting. But you're probably right. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Because they they did make a a lot of, you know, when they did the regionalization, um, a lot of the the changes that they made were also related to weather. Look at Suzuka, because Suzuka was in the rainy season back when it was in the fall. um, And now it is in the um, cherry blossom season, um, which is really, really pretty. And everyone was obsessed with that while we were there uh, last week, last uh, two weeks. But yeah, it'll, it'll be really interesting to, you know, have another year of this regionalization get used to the fact that like I know that Baku is like not a big deal race but the fact that it's like toward the like second half of the season to me just feels really weird it does it does and we're still waiting on the sprints so uh, I hope they make less sprints I mean I know that they won't but I hope so they do. question for uh, you Catherine yes if you had to pick like three sprint tracks what would you pick for next season Hmm. And they can be current or not current sprint races. I know you hate sprints. No, the yes. podcast hates sprints. But if you had to pick like three, which ones would you pick? Uh, let me pull up the calendar so I can I can look. I think I think Austria. Yep, that's I on can, my list. I can I can live with Austria. Um, Baku as a sprint last year wasn't the worst, or was it? Was it that? No, Baku was bad. Never mind. Um, I think a sprint in Mexico would be interesting, is interesting. Um, definitely not Qatar. Um, where else? I don't know. Maybe it would help Miami be less of a boring race. Yeah. Either It would either help Miami or destroy Miami. Yeah. Um, so I... I love Austria just because it's such a quick track. I right. love I love that it's a, uh, that for a sprint. I love Brazil as a sprint. Love oh, Brazil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like last year's was super exciting. I want Monaco to be a sprint. Oh my god, that would be the most ridiculous. Yeah, like I don't I don't see them ever making Monaco a sprint, but I'd like oh, to no. see it. I think it'd be interesting. Or it could be extremely boring because nothing happens, but I feel like there's enough there for it to be exciting that it intrigues me, and I would watch that sprint happily. That's a really good question. I Because one of the problems with Monaco at this point is that the cars are so big that it's basically, it's all about your qualifying position. So it's all about pit stop strategy and, you know, somebody crashes and maybe weather i mean monaco last year was actually very exciting that was really good the whole weekend was really good but i i don't it it would either really help it or really hurt it but at the same time and and we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit my biggest concern for the sprint races is this season's sprint format and I don't think that this Wait, season's sprint Wait, you have format. issues with the sprint format? 
I mean, we've only been talking about those issues since they announced them. But yes, I think that that, that's going to be one of the sprint weekend's biggest downfalls, other than the fact that for the for the non-American sprint races and for the non-China sprint race, the the sprint races itself are at like two o'clock in the morning for me. So I'm going to be up in the middle of the night, wherever I am in the, you know, whether I'm I'm here or I'm, I'm in California for the summer. And it's like... I like I don't wake up for FP2 for a reason and now I'm going to have to wake up for the damn sprint because it's in the time slot for FP2. Can you complain a little bit more about the sprint format please? No, I think I think if it changes Just and wait. goes to where like the sprint race is qualifying for the yes! actual race, then Monaco would be so exciting. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, or just sprints in general, but whatever. I don't know. I just I just was curious of where cuz we have they haven't been announced for 2025 yet so I was curious what your yeah. thoughts and feels were and what you would want to see on the calendar but yeah it'll be interesting I think that the shorter tracks are some of the better suited for the right. sprint races yep I thought Brazil was fine like it wasn't yeah. amazing but it, I did I did like Brazil last year yeah Br- Brazil was whatever um it wasn't the worst of the sprint weekend like i like brazil in general is a great race weekend right but and i think it would have been better had it not been a sprint um and like like the qatar sprint weekend was just like a hot damn mess emphasis hot and everybody almost died yeah that was um, not good yeah so it, it'll be it'll be interesting to see which ones are um chosen to be sprint races in the coming months we'll see mm-hmm Oh, all right. Another forward looking item. Um, we will get to China eventually. <laughs> we have a lot to talk maybe about more in China. On, Don't maybe worry. more went on than I thought the, over these last two weeks. Um, so there are rumors that F1 teams are seeking to limit the number of teams allowed on the grid for the new Concord agreement for 2026 to 2030. Um, I hate this so much. Please share your thoughts and feels, Catherine. <laughs> I really, really dislike this. So going into the background, obviously Andretti has been trying to get a Formula One team onto the grid. Right. Um, they, he passed the um, the FIA's challenge, you know, list, list of challenges. Um, and then when they got to the FOM, Formula One Management, which is the teams and, and, you know, Formula One is an organization, they said no for a number of reasons. One of them was um, some concerns about a lack of competitiveness competitive car um but the other one was there that wasn't really talked about was definite but was definitely an issue is the um the dilution of the prize money so there's a big pool of prize money available every year and the teams get a percentage of it based on their finishing in the driver's standing so if you have an 11th team that gets divided into 11 portions instead of 10 at the same time formula one is valued so highly right now that any in in my opinion any dilution of prized funds is going to be negligible based on the benefits of another team coming onto the grid and more drivers coming onto the grid and more international eyes on the sport yeah you recoup it with the the increased visibility literally immediately like there there's no um there's no question of it i think that this is a really greedy move um from from the teams that i think is is incredibly short-sighted one of the excuses that the teams um or that fom as an organization came out and said was that andretti would benefit more from the formula one brand than formula one would benefit from andretti and i'll link um if you're watching this on youtube to our full discussion about this but that is bullcrap um and they just need to get used to the fact that you can have more than 10 teams and still have a, you know, a profitable Formula One season. Yeah, I mean, playing devil's advocate here just for, you know, purposes. Um, maybe they have a lot of market research because they would have had to do market research in order to do this. So maybe it does show those I things. So. I'm not saying it does, but, you know. I'm saying that whatever market research they did do <laughs> was inaccurate. I and just, you and I'm I have just trying just, to play devil's advocate here. I know you are. I know, I know we've you talked are. about this, but you know, maybe, maybe bringing an eleventh team does dilute the competitiveness, maybe, and maybe it does dilute the 
payment, even though I know that they'd have to pay a ton in to kind of make up for that as well. Uh, we've talked about this. Andretti is an, would be an American team, so like a true American team because Haas is kind of Italian with their Ferrari links, kind of American. Kind um, of just meh. Kind of just meh. And, you know, Andretti has a really good history in motorsport and it would bring more eyes in the U.S. At, there's exactly to this coin, but... I mean, clearly this is, but I, I will say that... Max Verstappen does more to damage the competitiveness of Formula One than so Andretti admit it. would. So of you course admit they do. it. He's destroying the sport. No, he's not. Please We've had that discussion this. anyway. Please clip this so we have it no. forever and ever. No, Max Verstappen not. destroying Formula One. Coming from absolutely a Red not. Bull fan. But it is the the there's a lack of competitive uh, of perceived competitiveness. Com- right. Words, Catherine, competitiveness um, because of Max's dominance. And that's not going to change whether it's 11 teams or 12 teams or 10 teams. Um, so, and and this wouldn't stop other teams from coming onto the grid, but you would have to buy one out. And I think that the most vulnerable ones for any type of buyout would be Haas and would be Alpine, especially yeah. in light of what's going on with both teams right now. No, I agree. I agree. I. <laughs> <laughs> Six one way, half dozen another, because, like, to us, it really doesn't matter. We're just fans, you know what I mean? So, like, if they add another team, great. If they don't, great. It's still a great sport. It's still super competitive. But I think it just shows, like, the greed of the owners. And that's yes. what, like, bothers me. But Yeah, agreed. Neither here nor there. We'll see. I still really want to see Andretti come to the grid. Like really I agree. Well. And and this um so this Concord agreement won't be signed until mid 2025 is what is what it looks like and Andretti um the the update on Andretti right now is Andretti will be entering teams in F2 and F3 to kind of solidify their base of becoming a feeder team into Formula One they've opened a new um factory facility um in the UK so they're you know even though the the answer was no not right now because they want a new Concord agreement and they want the higher dilution fee um it is I I I still feel that it's an inevitability and I don't think that they're going to, you know, actually cut it to 10, you know, make a limit of 10 teams, but those are the rumors and I think they're dumb. I mean, they could also just buy out Haas. Exactly. Which is so. definitely an option. In our lifetime, know, I think we will see Andretti come to the gr- to come to the grid. And I also think we'll see Haas leave it. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've also had some helmets drop, which is really exciting. Yeah. Emily Emily loves her helmets and her, her uh, you know, special liveries. But I think the one that we were most looking forward to was Zhou Guan Yu. It is his home race. It's his first yeah. home race because he was a rookie during the the COVID off years. Um, so he came out with a really cool, like, white helmet with almost neon coloring to uh, symbolize the Shanghai underground. And, like, there's other landmarks on it. I really like it. I think it's very unexpected especially considering all of his other designs. I think it pops, it stands out, it's different. It's paying homage to Shanghai. Um, I really like it a lot. I was a little, I, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit underwhelmed and you and I have talked about this extensively over the last couple of days, but my favorite part of the helmet is there's a picture of him on the back at one of the races years ago when he was a little kid and just like the and he posted on social media today there um he was at the chinese grand prix 20 years ago and now he's back as a driver so he's doing a lot of like homages to when he was young and when he was you know growing up as a motorsport fan and to see him you know see the then and now that's really really cool no it is it is and i definitely think like i mean i'm so george also has a special helmet it's red with gold which are very significant colors in Chinese culture and there's a big dragon also big significance in Chinese culture so I think that is kind of the typical thing we would think to see on helmets and maybe that was what we were more expecting from Zhou Guan Yu not you know the underground and just white 
I think um, I was expecting something a little bit bolder color wise yeah. from Joe because we we've had a lot of that before. Like his um his Kota helmet last year was that leather one. Oh, I um, think that's one of my top five favorite helmets. Of right, all and time. like even this year's helmet is you know it's got the holographic. It's really bold. So this is a lot more understated, which is not exactly what I was expecting. Yeah. I agree, but I do like it, and I think it's cool how yeah. it's, like, there's a lot of ties to, um, to you know, Shanghai and, and to him as well, so I like it. Yeah. That but said, I will say, Albon's is the best <laughs> by Albon, far. By a million miles. It, this this could be one of the top helmets of the year, um, and I am going to have to move all of our little helmet discussions into a rundown of itself because I think we're going to have to talk about our favorite helmets of the year. Oh, absolutely. But this, so Alex Albon released a panda head helmet. It's full so on. Panda. It, is, it, is a, it is a panda bear as a helmet. I love it so much. It's not like pandas on the helmet it is i am a panda hear me roar like and then he said he posted pictures with pandas and i was like oh sold it, amazing i like 100 out of 10 i love this helmet so much it's one yeah. of my favorites no it's so good i'm obsessed um i'm sure more helmets will drop we are recording this on wednesday um so i'm sure we'll see more but of the ones we've seen so far they're pretty good I just, I yeah. think, I think honestly, George took an easy way out and just did a very like dragon, red, gold. I think it's boring. Yeah. I know you like it, but it I just do seems like very it. boring and like hammer on nail. But I mean, I mean, yeah, but I'm glad we did have one of those. No, on that's the grid. That's like, let, let's have a, a good Chinese helmet. It's like how, you know, Yuki's helmet um, in his home race. Also not our favorite um, compared to his, you know, regular race to race helmet, in our yeah. opinion. And then you have, you know, Sergeant's race, home race helmet in Miami. It's like, eagle flag, Eagles. I'm American. <sighs> yeah, God. exactly. Anyways. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to see the rest of the helmets. Hopefully we have more. We can talk about them in our recap episode next yeah. week. But let's get into China. Yeah, I I found all of the the coverage of like then and now this this past week fascinating because oh, yeah. you know Formula One was not remotely on my radar in 2019. Um, as as we know, I didn't get into it until 2021, and you were in what 22 ish. Is that that when you got into D maybe uh, DTS? It was the I know time is really hard season. for you. Yeah, it was the 2021 season of DTS, so then I fully started in 2022. Yeah, so so we had no concept of the Chinese Grand Prix other than, oh, China's canceled. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know that China 2019 was Formula One's thousandth F1 race. I didn't know that either. No. I saw that this week, which kind of surprised me. I don't know yeah. why it surprised me, but it did. I know it was just it was it was very interesting that it wouldn't be like a European race because you know Formula One got its start in Europe. Um, one would think that it, but that's that's just where the calendar went. Honestly, though, it probably was just like here's our schedule. Oh, interesting. Yeah. China is a thousand. You know, yeah. it probably wasn't a whole thought out process, but yeah, I know. did watch the the race on Monday. Um, you know, when I was having having finished doing my taxes which I held off until the last minute but I did them um I I was like I'm gonna treat myself to watching uh China on F1 TV and I go. did and it was it was an interesting race I feel like the way Formula One marketed itself back in 2019 was different to what it would have done now and I think that it would have been like a huge production of a show if we had had the the thousandth race closer to now yeah. um they they had you know they had a really nice um you know intro and there was a, like a little sprinklings of dramas here and there but it was mostly lewis hamilton won valtteri botas was in second and sebastian vettel when he was at ferrari was in third botas was also at mercedes at the time um but it was it was it was a really interesting snapshot because 2019 was an very interesting season for, yeah. for a bunch of teams. Yeah. Our fastest lap was Pierre Gasly in a Red Bull. 
before yeah, that he got just demoted. Yeah, that's how how much has changed um in just a few years well five years i guess but yeah that was and if you've watched drive to survive you know this this is the season where pierre gasly was demoted to um toro rosso halfway through the season and alex albon was promoted (sighs) god bless him alex albon had a great race he um started from the pit lane and actually managed to finish p10 well and he this was his rookie season right him and lando and george yeah, they were they were the rookie class. Lando was, of course, at McLaren where he is now, but this was when George was at Williams. Um, and there were a ton of guys who were on the grid um, then who are not now. Roman Grosjean from Haas, who was the one whose car exploded in 2020. Um, Sebastian Vettel, obviously. Kimi Raikkonen was driving for Alfa Romeo at the time. Um, Robert Kubica was at Williams for his F1 comeback. I talked about him in our Young Driver episode. Yeah other day Antonio Giovinazzi who he he just won Le Mans um he was driving uh, last year he won Le Mans um he was driving for Alfa Romeo as well and it was the year that Esteban Ocon took off from Formula One to spend as the Mercedes reserve driver such an interesting year where was our man uh, Fernando Alonso was he was he on the grid or was that was winter uh was that a retirement year that was a retirement year. He was in the World Endurance Championship, and he also won the 24 Hours in the Mon. Of course he did. Yeah. Uh, God bless him. Yeah, so he was keeping busy, even though he wasn't actually on the Formula One grid. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah. So, yeah, lots of things have changed since uh, China 2019. I want to say 2020, but it's 2019. 19. Yeah. Five years ago. Um, it was not a sprint weekend. And no. we have a sprint weekend. Yes. It is our first sprint of the season. Yes. No, Zhou Guan Yu and Oscar Piastri, Yuki Sonoda, and Logan Sargent, they did not have to endure a sprint weekend in China in 2019 because they weren't on the F1. They weren't anywhere near the F1 grid in 2019. Yeah, Zhou Guan Yu was in F2. Oscar Piastri was um, driving the Formula Renault Euro Cup, and Sonoda and Sargent were down in F3. Um, and now they're all going to be driving a track that they've never seen before. Ugh. All right. So, jumping into this whole sprint because it is our first <laughs> one. Yeah. Um, let's remind everyone of the wonderful sprint format that has graced our presence this year. So, Friday, we have FP1 and sprint qualifying or the sprint shootout. Saturday is the sprint and then qualifying. And then Sunday, we have the race. Yeah. So. I hate it. I don't love. um, Also very worried about performance and how competitive the sprint's going to be because of qualifying being where it is we already know people are having chassis problems at williams so what happens you know if something happens during the sprint and then you can't qualify then you don't race oh i don't like this at all well you do race but you race from the back so if if you crash in the sprint not if you don't have a chassis (laughs) well if if you're williams you you probably won't but the the biggest problem for me is the sprint being um, before qualifying for for the the actual Grand Prix. Like if you crash in the sprint and you can't get repaired in time, then you're starting from the back. Yeah. And the thing that sucks too is like, what if it's something that's completely out of your control and it's someone else's fault? Like what if someone bumps you and you did nothing wrong and then you're screwed for qualifying and you're screwed for the race? Yeah, I, think and it, I think it adds like too that. many it adds too many variables that make it not fun. Give us the 2021 format back. It no. wasn't perfect, but at least it set the grid for Sunday. So like why do we have to have two separate qualifying sessions? And I'm not asking you this specifically, I'm asking the universe. Why do we need two qualifying sessions in one weekend? I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that question. I mean, I, 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 I don't know either. And I think that that's the, 
that's one of the biggest problems is why are you trying to shoehorn two qualifyings when you can actually make the sprint relevant? Because all the sprint does is give you more points to the championship. Right. Um, but if, and cause there's no like sprint championship or whatever. So, you know, all it is, is an opportunity to crash your car another time. And now if you crash your car, it just gets worse. Right. Which begs, you know, my question of, is it even going to be competitive because they're worried about qualifying but right. I mean, I, and I think we've talked about like making a sprint championship, like add more sprint re- weekends or whatever and have a whole championship just for the sprints, which I don't love that idea, but at least it would make it semi-competitive. Yeah, it, like at, at this point, it's like there's no point to the sprint races. They don't mm-hmm. necessarily bring more excitement. They didn't, you know, other than say Oscar Piastri winning a sprint that was completely overlooked by the fact that Max clinched the world championship um, in Qatar last year, there there's no point to no. the sprint race. Like, and, and there's no, you know, crazy grid movement either. Like, yeah. and that's what they, they want is, is a more mixed up type of grid, but that's not giving it to us right now. And I don't think that this format is going to, to give it to us. Maybe China will prove me wrong, but I don't think that this new format is going to give us the type of mixed up grid that they're looking for in the sprints compared to the regular Grand Prix. Agreed. Agreed. Yep. So with that said, let's get into our predictions for the sprint. <laughs> yeah. Yay. I ha- I'm going to be honest here. I don't love my predictions because oh, not only mine. do we, not only do we have, you know, our regular predictions, but we also have predictions for the sprints that will go into the same points format that we always use. But I'm just like, I think it's because we don't know who's going to do well in China. We don't know historically who's done well within the, within the regulation. Cause this is a brand new track. Basically. Basically. Yeah. And I think the hard thing too, is it's the first sprint of the, season and I mean car performance has not been completely consistent I would say across the field no um so and sprints you know they are a shorter race I don't know I think mine is a smorgasbord of madness mine is a (laughs) cop-out honestly mine probably is too I don't know we'll see anyway so last year Catherine and I started doing predictions but we kind of had discussions about them. We could see this year we're doing them blind essentially. So we, and we're keeping track of points to make it more competitive. And so Emily doesn't, you know, put Alex Albon on the podium when he clearly doesn't deserve to be there. Everybody put Alex Albon on the podium that one weekend, except me. I was, it was group thing for sure. Um, But we're awarding ourselves points. So if you get pole, you get one point, you have to get the whole podium in the correct order And you get five points. And then if you pick P8 for sprint or P10 for the race, you get three points. Um, That one's always really hard. Um, But yeah, Yeah. so let's start with our sprint poll. Catherine, who do you have? Who do you think I have? I picked Max Max again. Max Verstappen, yeah. Same. So cool. Glad we're on the same page there. Yeah. Um, Good, good. So, also, if you didn't listen to last uh, race's episode, Catherine and I picked identical predictions, which... We did. Normally, we differ a lot, but, um, yeah, we we had identical. So, let's see where we are here. So, for your sprint podium, who's on your sprint podium? Yeah, see, that... This this is where, like... I don't know, this... I, I went with Max Checo Carlos. Okay. I yeah. did... So, I don't think Carlos, like, thrives under sprint conditions. So I did Max Checo Lando. Ooh, which interesting. Which I'm, like, not loving. I considered Lando, but the one of the problems, and I, I tried to look up, like, characteristics of the, the China course last night, and then I got distracted. And the the issue that McLaren has is straight line speed, and there's a lot of I know. straight lines in, in, I know. in, in Shanghai. I know. So. I know. I know. You're probably going to get it right, and I'm just going to keep, like – failing i'm I mean, only gonna i swear i'm only gonna get points for pole this season because it's so hard for me yeah i mean it's 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 nice to to mix it up i just and i i considered lando but i i just i don't i know no because I, I considered I, it too but i just i couldn't i just i feel like if i just pick the same people every single week it's not gonna be fun so i have to throw a little excitement in there right right i get that my my thing is 
I just think that this is going to be a race of the people who are currently at the they, top. they do well everywhere. Yeah. Yep. I think that's what we're going to have here because this is equaling the playing field from a track experience standpoint. So it's going to be who's just a ridiculously good Formula One car driver. No, I get that for sure. Okay, for the sprint P8. So in the sprint P8, the last position where you get a point, you get one point for P8. We give ourselves three because it's really hard to pick. So yeah. who is your P8 driver for China? This is where I did go a little balls to the wall. I picked Botas for some reason. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Oh, because they don't have to do a pit stop? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Solely. Exactly. Sans pit stop. Um, yes. I did stroll. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like every sprint last season, he was like seven, eight or nine. So I feel pretty comfortable with stroll. Watch. He's going to like DNF and not even place, but <sighs> I feel like yeah. stroll is a pretty safe bet. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned about our, our dear old Lance. So <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see is, is all I'm, I'm saying. <laughs> Start working on the backhand lands. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to Sunday's race, who do you have for your pole position? Also Max. Yeah, okay, same. Max or yeah. like the And like the problem is, and, and obviously we, we do these predictions, you know, on Wednesday before the weekend starts on purpose, but I think that this is going to really bite us um, throughout the entire sprint season is – you know, because qualifying start is, is on freaking Saturday, Saturday yeah. that yeah. it's, it's going to be, you know, who knows who survived on, on the sprint. So we should give ourselves a caveat of sprint weekends. And if there's damage where people can't go into qualifying that we can like redo our race predictions. I can live with that. I can absolutely live with All that. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Motion fast. Okay. Um, cool. So you're so, cool. Oh, I have Max as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I figured. Yep, yep. And then podium for the race. I have Max Carlos Checo. Oh, I know. Real, you. real thrilling. Uh, you. Sa same podium as the sprint, but a little mixed up. Um, so you're banking then on Checo not qualifying well in the second set of qualifying. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Also, I think it's weird to have to, like we were saying, you have to qualify twice. It's like, w w like that seems so convoluted and stupid because why would you do that twice and what if you do worse for the race and then you do better for the sprint but like the sprint doesn't matter i hate this yeah. anyways moving yeah. on um i will get off my soapbox now um i have max checo carlos so okay have, so you have, have my your sprint, podium. sprint yeah i have your sprint podium okay interesting also, you know, probably a podium we might see a lot this year unless a lot this charles year. gets the better strategy or ferrari decides stuff carlos but who knows? Yeah, this this is it's gonna be the 2022 Max Checo Charles podium. Oh my gosh. Um or anyway. Hambot Vare, uh, for those of you uh who who were uh watching the sport in 2020 and 2021 when that basically was every podium. CC. Okay, moving on to P10 for sa Sunday's race. So in the race, P10's the last position where you get a point where you get in the points, P10 you get one point. Again, we give ourselves three. Who is your P10 for the Chinese Grand Prix? I went with Nico Hulkenberg. I did too. Ah! <laughs> I had a feeling you were going to because you randomly will like throw Hulk out there. Yeah. Um, but I'm just like sitting there thinking and I'm like, I just, I feel like I don't want to, I can't pick Yuki because I, I feel right. like he's, you know, doing better. I don't know. I want to see Yuki in like the the eight nine range. I, I want to see you honestly. I want to see Yuki and Danny get like P seven P eight, and I know. I they mean, can, also that. But... <sighs> yeah, 
I just want, I I just want better for RB in general, but I I actually considered making Daniel my P10 pick, but I felt that that was a little too risky. Yeah. Yeah. I I think we, I, before I can go back to making any positive Daniel picks and he needs to start, you know, finishing races. Okay. So biggest surprise for the weekend my biggest surprise was that Williams is going to survive the weekend with two intact cars. <laughs> Honestly, I really hope you're right. For JV's sake. For, oh my God, poor JV. But yeah, I just, I feel like that would be the biggest surprise of the weekend because there's so much at risk. And the China start, like the first couple turns off the line, we could see some some not great action happening and we can see some crashes yeah. and yeah the williams cars just seem to be so susceptible to crashes i mean in in 2019 we had daniel kvyat hitting not one but two mclarens um, honestly that's you know, impressive to hit two cars at once yeah um and only one dnf but they didn't but lando didn't dnf until like late in the race and carlos yeah. was just like out of the point so it was mahula for both of them and kvyat did retire but Kvyat, he always like him retiring is not a shock. Super random and off topic, but mm-hmm. for Williams, have you seen how people are saying like Logan Sargent's seat is up in the air and they're not confident about it? He's probably going to lose it. Like, give the guy a break. We're five races in, and he had to sit out a race. And he's driving with like a half broke rebuilt car. Like, give him a break. I don't know. And th- this is coming from someone who was so hard on Sargent last year in his rookie season, but. Yeah. I think it's so early to to speculate for him. Yeah, and I think that, you know, is Logan Sargent's seat at risk? Yes, probably. Um, is that a decision that Williams is going to make in April, May, or June? No. No. They, you know, they're going to give him the time to to make a case for himself. Is it likely that he's going to? I don't know. Not right now. But you're right. He's dealing with like a half broke car um, that he got secondhand from his teammate. And, you know, the it's, you know, Will, Williams is is a team that progresses throughout the year. So there yeah. is hope that they will get better, unlike with Alpine, who are just Alpine. Yeah, I think I think. You know, Albon needs to move on from Williams. He's so much better than being at Williams. Oh, but I, absolutely. But I think JV, like, is really into this idea of investing in a driver and helping grow the team with his vision with people who buy in. And maybe that's Sargent. It seems like they have a great rapport and a great relationship. So I'd like to see Sargent stay on the grid. Um, I know, not my same song and dance from last season but i know i don't know but we'll the and the other question is is who is available to replace these drivers how right. many um and we kind of talked about that in the young driver episode but there are not a lot of you know potentials right now the i think the driver with the most potential who's not currently on the grid to get a seat for next year would be ollie bearman yeah um but he would he's not gonna, he's probably not going to go to williams he's going to go to like haas if anything I feel like Haas is where your rookie career goes to die. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, would, it might not be great, but I, I don't, you know, with with his, you know, Ferrari, you know, ties, I don't see him going to Williams. No, absolutely not. Not over Kimi Antonelli. No, no, um, no, no. And, and Kimi Antonelli, he just tested um, – today slash yesterday when tuesday wednesday ish in in the mercedes car so he's yeah. getting a little bit of, of f1 car experience right now um and i i, I think that i mean he's absolutely a child so i think the real question is is mercedes gonna go with carlos or is he gonna go with kimmy um yeah. and i think that's that's gonna be the real question in there yeah sorry i didn't mean to anyway. get us off track but going to my biggest surprise Yes. Um, I have that Zhou Guan Yu is going to have a very good first home race. Ooh, I like that. I qualify very good for all purposes of not DNFing, ma- making it to Q2, and, you know, maybe finishing between 11 and 13. Yeah. I feel like that's not a lot to ask, but maybe it is. All I mean, for, for Sauber, yeah, the... the the and I 
to to be fair, Sauber did drastically improve their pit stops they did. in Suzuka. Um, they were closer to the four second range, which would be a bad pit stop for anybody else. But for them, considering their pit stops were in the 13, 15, 52 second range, that's an improvement. So I think that they're getting a handle on the wheel nut issue that they've been fighting all year long. Um, and hopefully over these two weeks, <clears throat> you know, while Botas and, you know, while, while Joe Guan Yu was showing Botas around his hometown, um, that they, you know, the, the team itself was working on, you know, continuing to fix, make these tweaks to fix these issues. Yeah, no, I, I just hope he does well. I really hope he stays yeah. on the grid. I really like him. I think he's so good for the sport. I just, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. The fashion game. I can't <sighs> wait for the fashion game though. I know. Yeah, Tokyo. Not gonna lie, or not Tokyo. Uh, Suzuka, Japan. Um, disappointed. Disappointed. But yeah. maybe we'll see some good stuff in Shanghai. We'll see. I hope so. All right, who's gonna do a dumb, Catherine? Um, there's I so have, many to pick from, but I have Aston Martin, but specifically the Lance Stroll side of the Aston Martin garage. I think that we're gonna. I think we're gonna pick up where we left off two weeks ago in Suzuka, and it's not gonna go well for him. Get some more angry radio calls. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was giving um, Fernando when he was at McLaren with Honda and and the the GP two radio call that Fernando made. It was giving. So at least it was Lance giving is lear- Yuki. Yuki. <laughs> it, it was at least Lance is learning from Fernando. We can see clearly that he's learning from Fernando. But I I I don't. I know that you you picked Lance for your P eight. I don't know how that's necessarily gonna go that that's my that's my highlight concern of the of the weekend other than alpine being alpine we will see let the chips fall where they may exactly (laughs) um so yeah i have uh alpine period just you just want alpine just shit in the bed left and right um i think they just have too many opportunities to make missteps this weekend with it being a sprint yes um i don't know how but akon has done surprisingly well in qualifying i would say gasly not so much yeah um they're just such a non-factor and so irrelevant like no offense but they're not good and i just think there's too many too many opportunities for them just to mess it all up yeah very very similar to you know williams has you know so many opportunities for this to go badly for them and i love how alpine has become the ferrari strategy dumb of of this season because oh, yeah. last season it was who's gonna do a dumb ferrari strategy ferrari strategy has been not terrible this year well that's so because far, it's, it's not still ferrari early strategy it's, it's carlos, carlos strategy, Sainz strategy yeah. and and ferrari he, he's not letting them uh screw screw him over i just again to go off topic if carlos ends up at a shit team i'm gonna be so pissed because he's driving so well he's out driving the car that he currently has out driving his teammate he's performing super well i mean he's not even two months off of getting his appendix out let's just like reiterate this and he's driving amazing like give the guy a good seat damn it yeah (laughs) Yeah, it, motorsport on, in, on motorsport com on Instagram was like, "Who's the most underrated driver of the of on the grid?" And I'm like, "It's Carlos." Like, right. it's like people it's, give him it's credit. Alex Albon, but it's Carlos. Right, people give him credit, but I don't think they give him the full credit he deserves because everyone's like, "Oh my gosh, Max is so good," and then it's like, "Oh, Checo, Checo's not that good. He has a good car. He's not a great driver." Yeah. I will go on every record and say that. Like, if you put Carlos in Checo's car. It's going to be way more competitive between him and Max than Checo and Max. Yeah. And at the same time, when you're comparing, you know, Carlos to his teammate, to to Charles, like, I don't understand why everybody's so obsessed with Charles when you have Carlos right here. I know. I I, I think you. Like, Charles is a good driver, but he's not the driver people make him out to be. I, I just, I don't, I don't see it. No. Honestly, I don't know if I can be a Ferrari fan next season. I think I'm going to have to find a new team. Because you have, to you have Carlos. Prince Percival and you have Lewis Hamilton. And I just, I don't know if I can stand behind these decisions. I, I, I don't know. But if, if Carlos does go to Mercedes, are we going to have, I'm going to have to be nice to Mercedes. 
Ugh. or at least half of Mercedes. That's a little weird of, for me. A little bit of Catherine's going to die. We've just little, announced little, a little lot of me. news on this podcast. You've admitted that Max Verstappen is renewing the sport, and I've admitted that I, I need to leave not. Ferrari. So <laughs> I'm just going to keep peppering it in every like every so we often. We have an so entire so episode of why Max isn't ruining. <laughs> now you're flip-flopping on this, Catherine. Make a decision. You can't have it both ways. I I I definitely can. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yokes, yokes, yokes. Poor well, Canolo's dose is my catchphrase. <laughs> so I definitely can have it both ways. <sighs> and I do. Well, final thoughts going into China. I'm very excited. I'm excited to see it live in person for the first time in five years. I think it's going to be very interesting. I think it might be a little wild, but I'm pumped. Yeah, and I hope it's wild in a good way. And I, I I don't have any confidence in this sprint format. I hope we get pleasantly surprised. I mean, you know, shocker, I have no confidence in the sprint for, for, format. I have what have I been all confidence in the sprint format? What, what what have I been talking about this entire episode? But I I feel like um this has the potential to be a good weekend. I think this could be a really exciting weekend where we can see success out of drivers that haven't really done much this season because Agreed. you have such an even playing field by the fact that nobody's driven here in five years um so that uh, it's not going to completely even the playing field but it will give us something 100 percent agree yeah one honey all right that brings us to our f1 fun fact of the episode so Catherine, hit us with your f1 fun fact so i thought this was really interesting you know A lot of um, Formula One tracks themselves, when they're designed, they have specific, you know, influences. For example, Las Vegas looks like Lewis Hamilton's dog, Roscoe, upside down. Um, (laughs) But the the track layout for China in the the Shanghai circuit is really cool because the first character in the um, in the word Shanghai in Chinese, Shang, is the lay like that's the layout is is that like the oh, shape so of cool. the letter it, yeah it was it was heavily inspired for that and so like if you look at the letter side by side with the track design you're like oh hey i can see the letter in there that's so intentional. at least that's what i thought when i, I when i figured that out last night yeah that's i think so it, cool. it's 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 pretty cool i think we need to it do a deep cool. dive into like f1 track design i think that should be another f101 love it make note <laughs> We'll include Malaysia just to make you happy. I love Malaysia. I know you do. We want to see it back. <laughs> I want right. to bang back. <laughs> bring it back. Uh, well, coming up next, we will have our Chinese Grand Prix recap coming out on Tuesday. I will be making the 28-hour travel day of hell back to Argentina on Monday. So our episode is going to be coming out on Tuesday, one day later than normal. Um, But that has been our Chinese Grand Prix predictions. Thanks for being off track with us, guys.